<laughs> I'm Eric Baker, and I've spent my life crossing the Southeast on tour as a singer-songwriter. But I recently realized I was always headed to the next town instead of seeing the sights along the way. So I teamed up with my friend Ariel Nicole to check out what we've been missing. We hope to take you to places you never knew existed or where you've always dreamed of going. I caught the tail end of a show the other evening that was all about inventors who have been overlooked. Folks who've had an impact on the world, but you might not necessarily know about them. The list included pivotal advancements in technology and medicine, along with conveniences and staples that we use each and every day. It's funny how a lot of times as humans, we'll benefit from something without stopping to question where it came from. Perhaps it's because once we have the answer to one question, we've inevitably uncovered a hundred more. That was certainly the case for me when I came across Clarksdale, Mississippi. While the name might not ring a bell, the legend of Robert Johnson and the crossroads where he sold his soul to the devil are likely more familiar folklore. But in the decades since the devil made his infamous deal, Clarksdale has popped up in some quirky ways, most recently welcoming some popular proprietors, as well as a blues festival that's internationally renowned. So on this episode of Tennessee Valley Uncharted, we're headed to the crossroads to see for ourselves what this small city is all about. Just down Highway 49, on the way into town, stands the Hobson Commissary, a hip joint where local and unofficial historian Robert Birdsong serves up forgotten facts right alongside cocktails. The story of the crossroads is not so much a deal with the devil. 1989, 1990, Ken Burns started doing a series of documentaries of music highways around the country. Levon Helm got to tell the story of Highway 61. Looked at the camera and said, here I am at Robert Johnson's Crossroads. With that, we're kind of stuck with it. Okay. You know, we're not gonna <laughs> yeah. argue with Levon Helm. Yeah. You know? Birdsong, who's been hosting tours for over 20 years, is a notable native with endless insight into what makes Clarksdale and the stories that surround the city so special. The story of the crossroads and its importance in Clarksdale is a migration story. In the 1860s, when blacks were freed from the farms uh, and could travel, they did, and they did so prolifically. And this st started a hundred years of out-migration from the south to the north. And Highway 49 starts in uh, Gulfport. Highway 61 starts in New Orleans. But they meet in Clarksdale, and then 49 takes the west side of the Mississippi River and goes to St. Louis. 61 turns into 3rd Street, crosses Beale, and then on to Chicago. Well, during this out-migration period, and we don't know when blues evolved, but by 1903, it had. Clarksdale's New World District and the audience in Clarksdale, after watching all this evolution of blues music into a performing arts, uh, became very particular in what they accepted as good blues. You can make it on Beale Street, you can make it in St. Louis, you can make it in Chicago. But if you can't please the crowd in Clarksdale, you got some more work to do. While Clarksdale is in some ways small in size, it's home to more musical venues than many big cities can claim. And from the sounds of it, the Deep Blues Festival is already kicking off. So we're headed to what you might call Ground Zero to learn more. Similar to the city, Bill Luckett is a man of many layers. An actor, producer, longtime attorney, and recent mayor of Clarksdale, Luckett is also co-owner of one of the figurehead venues of the Deep Blues Festival. And given that the actual name of his establishment is the Ground Zero Blues Club, it seemed like a fitting place for us to start. Like many of the visitors that come through Clarksdale, Bill is not a native. But as he likes to say, while many folks came for the music, they stayed for the people. And Bill decided to not only stay, but set up shop to honor the history of the town and its heritage of making music. This came about uh, because of a friendship I've had for 22 years plus with Morgan Freeman, 
actor mm -hmm. who lives near here. Okay. Uh, and we uh, got to be good friends in the mid 90s. The more he would come to Clarksdale and look around, the more tourists he would notice and he would wonder, what are they all looking for? What are they doing? Mm -hmm. And for some time, I've been hearing from the Delta Blues Museum across the street from mm -hmm. where we are. Uh, that the tourists were usually asking the same question over and over and not getting a satisfactory answer. Okay. And the question was, where can we hear live blues music? Mm -hmm. So Morgan and I had the wherewithal and uh, perhaps a vision to say we can answer that question, we'll open yeah. a blues club. So we opened our first night, it was May 11, 2001. The world comes here, literally, mm -hmm. the world now, and we've gotten a lot of recognition, especially recently. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in the top three best live music venues in the world, according to American Airlines. We're the best music city outside of Nashville. I read that article. Fodor's Travel put us there, and our club is the one mentioned in the article. And then bestbluesclubs.org ranked us the number one blues club in America. And Red's down the street, number two. Wow. So we've got one and two. Well, you guys are doing it right, and you're doing it well. Well, we, we're working on it still. But yeah, okay. we went from two nights a week live music now to four. And we literally spawned most of what you see here because okay. there weren't any other venues. There were no venues with consistently played live blues music. Okay. And we changed that. And now mm -hmm. on, on several nights, nights of the week you can hear music at alternate locations mm -hmm. here and we have live music somewhere in Clarksdale mm -hmm. seven nights a week. Yeah. New restaurants now opening, mm -hmm. uh, downtown has taken on a vibrancy and it's wonderful. When I started uh, getting into the blues music, there was one festival here called the Sunflower River Blues and Gospel Festival. Okay. That was it, one festival. Then some other guys here started the Juke Joint Festival. But now we have festivals, festivals, festivals. I and swear, if anybody were to just name one and put the time in, it would go yeah. over here. When I was growing up here, I thought blues was a wailing person in a cotton field. But I've learned, and I didn't learn this till midlife, that blues has got, there are a lot of happy songs. And you can dance to blues. It's just not uh, wailing, kind of moaning, groaning music kind of stuff. It's, it's very uh, good stuff. We've had so many wonderful stars come here and perform. Everybody from Jerry Lee Lewis to George Thorogood to uh, Willie Nelson. Mm -hmm. uh, just lots of good, good folks coming through. We treat bands fairly. I, that's the big takeaway. Blues artists were so totally exploited. Their rights they gave up, their music deals they assigned them away, the publishing they no longer own. I mean, it's, it's, it's really a sad situation. So we try to treat our bands right, and we try to be fair with them, and they appreciate it, and we appreciate it. So we're happy to advertise uh, a lot of good bands, and they all want to come here and play. Unlike many festivals where you walk through the gates and go from stage to stage, the Deep Blues Festival is as much about seeing the actual city of Clarksdale as it is about hearing the sounds she's inspired. So, after some action at Ground Zero, we headed out into the streets to see what else we could find. Originally from Seattle, Robin Colonis came to Clarksdale on a blues tour, but took to the town too much to leave. Soon, she took up ownership of the old theater, and quickly thereafter, the new Roxy was born. One thing, real quick, I didn't realize this was open top. Yes, yes, a lot of people don't realize, especially if you come in at night. Um, yeah. There has no roof on most of it. Um, there's some bird netting up there, but uh, open yeah. air, that's one of the things that makes us unique and different. It's got an interesting uh, acoustics, and it's nice, and people like it. And we have a fire pit, so we can have a fire in here yeah. sometimes. So there are times when it is cold and wet and yeah. or hot and um, no air conditioning. So gotcha. um, the number one frequently asked question here is, what do you do when it rains? Yeah. And there's actually a drain in the floor right underneath the table. The drain was originally there. It was a movie theater and oh, okay. built in the late 40s. wasn't a fancy theater and they would just rinse the floor down, I understand. So this really? was like this concrete was the original floor. Wow. You can see where the benches were nailed mm -hmm. in here. So they tell me that they would just hose the floor down with all the syrup and popcorn afterwards. And so oh, that's wow. how I happened to have a drain in the middle of the floor. So okay. it works. <laughs> the fact that we don't have a roof any longer. So. All right. Everything we do here is kind of small and funky, but um, it's definitely, it's a fun experience and yeah. it's different than what you're going to get in the big city. So one of the town mottos is Clarksdale, keeping it real. Okay. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're proud of this gruffy, um, you know, 
um, a little bit crumbling heritage, you know, we don't. Mm -hmm. There's a, a fine balance between making everything all cleaned up and tidy and new mm -hmm. and um, letting things just crumble and fall apart. Yeah. So I, I need to remortar the brick so it doesn't fall down, but I don't want to replaster it and make it look brand new. Yeah. Um, so I came to Clarksdale, Mississippi as a blues tourist. Okay. Um, I'm from Seattle and I specifically came here following the blues music. I wanted to see some of the artists that I was familiar with listening to. I wanted to see them, you know, in Mississippi and playing in a jute joint. Okay. And then I was vacationing in Mississippi in Clarksdale and then I bought a piece of property in 2005. Okay. And then in 2008, I bought the neighboring piece of property, okay, which yeah. is the new Roxy. Yeah. And so primarily my focus is more about being um, for any kind of the arts, the film or okay. live music or live theater production. So I just That's want this awesome. space to be used and be yeah. a part of the community and be a functioning part of it. This is a really interesting and open community of people here that connect with a lot of people that have moved here. Any day of the week in downtown Clarksdale in rural Delta, Mississippi, you will meet people from anywhere around the world, um, Europeans, um, a lot of Japanese tourists. Mm -hmm. People come from everywhere. If you follow rock and roll history and music history, you end up at the blues. And if you follow the blues history, you end up in Mississippi and, you know, okay. specifically so much of it in the Delta, so. Deke Harp was bitten by the blues bug when he was just a child. He went on to play professionally, and many times his music brought him through Clarksdale. So when he decided to come off the road and lay down some roots, setting up a shop here was a natural next step. It also just happened to be the only brick-and-mortar harmonica repair outfit in the world. So if you look at this tuner, this harmonica is a little bit off. It means it's flat, this note here. It's going this way. What I want to do is scratch off of the tip to bring the pitch up. Just a little bit of weight will change that wheel from spinning. My ear says, beautiful. I guess I was in seventh grade, okay. and they called it the boys room back then. I had to get permission to go to the bathroom, and I was on my way there, and I could hear this harmonica. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, what is that? Oh my god, wait a minute. So I opened up the door, and it just, it knocked me over. I said, uh, what is that thing? And he goes, oh, it's a harmonica. So I was like, oh, oh, oh a harmonica? I said, I, I, if I get one, would you show me what to do? He goes, well, let's see if you get one first. So I got home. I said, Mom, we're going, to, we're going to Main Street. We're going to get a harmonica. I picked out this one that was about this long. It was a Marine band. And I brought it to school the next day. And I asked him, I said, all right, I got a harmonica. Could you show me something? He goes, man, I ain't showing you nothing. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, nah, man, this is a secret thing. This is a very secret thing, and I won't show you. And I said, well, one day I'm going to be better than you. When you buy a harmonica off the rack, they set them for a certain way so that anybody can play them. But the pro players go nuts when they hear them, and they, they learn how to fix their own. And all along that I'm doing this, I want to make sure that the chord sounds real good, too. So I'll try it first. And it sounds boxy right now. So I'm working on that right now. Perfect. Now the, the, the chord is starting to come to life, but it's still got that ay, 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 ay. You know, I, I just kept one with me all the time. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I guess I was around 17 or 18. My brother, uh, Bob, told me about a guy named James Cotton. So I waited almost three years to find out where James Cotton was going to be playing. And I saw in uh, the Village Voice one day that he was going to be playing in a place called the Stanhope House. So I go there. His friend came right up and he says, oh, you want to meet James? Come on, I'll show you. Uh, and so we get in the dressing room and he's laying down on the couch and I'm like, oh, don't wake him up, don't wake him up. <laughs> and he woke him up and we hit it right off because I had a suitcase full of harmonicas and they were all set up A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And he was keeping his in a Chevis Regal bag and they were all clanging around. So he told his manager, I want a case just like Deke's. And I was like, oh, God, I'm inspiring the greatest yeah. man alive playing harmonica. I know you to were get just his loving ready. that. <laughs> so I said, well, you, you know, you're the greatest harmonica player alive. I, I want to learn from you. And he says, well, how about this? I'll pay you $100 a day, and you drive the bus, 
And I said, when could I start? Perfect. <laughs> James Cotton taught me how to listen for the harmonica. I used to sound like this. And then he would go. But once I learned how to get that, that deep. That's where I just kept going. And then about, I don't know, 20 years ago, I started breaking them so much. When I was playing in a band, mm -hmm. um, I was breaking two or three harmonicas each show. Oh, wow. That's when I started changing reeds and, and making just harmonicas for me. Okay. Until I started, I, I decided I wanted to round them and paint them, and, and then my career took off um, doing that, and then I had, gave up swinging a hammer, slinging harps. I had a quartet, a four-piece blues band in the 90s, all the way to about 98. I made my first record, which was in 01. I still was wanting to keep a, you know, a, a blues band going, mm -hmm. but um, like I said, it was economically wasn't mm -hmm. working. So I started going to the King Biscuit Blues Festival and busking in the streets, playing drums, harmonica, and guitar at the same time. And uh, that's how my music morphed into what I do right now. Okay. I used to play in the streets of Clarksdale during the Juke Joint Festival. I started playing guitar in four years ago, and it just changed everything. And now I'm touring the world. We have blues seven nights a week. So when I go home to eat, I stay home till about 9 o'clock. Then I get in my RV, and I drive to town, and I go check out the mm -hmm. who's playing. Every night I go out and hang out and see blues. <laughs> Seeing the care and craft with which Deke worked on the instruments in his shop, I can only imagine the passion that would come through if he played. Luckily, the blues is in his bones, and he was more than willing to oblige a quick concert. Ain't in no hurry at all. The more I hear in Clarksdale, the more I realize this city is about caring as much as it is about anything else. Caring about one another, about what came from the past, and about what can still come in the future, regardless of setbacks or shortcomings. So tomorrow, I'm headed to class to learn about how knowing what's in our local water sources is the first step in taking care of them. As you likely know, we have a lot of water here in the watershed known as the Tennessee Valley, which is why Vicki Valentine is one of three women who travel this territory, introducing school children to their local water sources and what's in them. As she explains, it's as much about making them aware of the impact we can have as humans on our water as it is about inspiring a new generation to see the subjects of science, technology, engineering, and math in a new light. This river runs almost like two blocks from town. Okay. And it runs through uh, Quibbon County and several counties in this part of Mississippi. And because we're doing a water quality lab mm -hmm. with the fifth graders at Quitman Middle School, we're going to get water that's actually from their community. Okay, that's Take cool. that to them. All right. And they're, that's what they're going to do their science experiment okay. on. It's been a while since I've had to heed the school bell, but now that we've collected some samples from Coldwater River, it's time to head to nearby Quitman Middle School for a few science experiments. So I had a student one time that looked at me with these big eyes that said, this is like a field trip coming to us. It's being outside, mm -hmm. and it's doing some hands-on, and it's different from your regular classroom. It's like a field yeah. trip. Part of it is that we're using water from their community. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a local connection. Yeah. I mean, I could bring water from the Mississippi River or the Tennessee River, and we could test it, and it would still be a great experience. But what I'm hoping for is that there's a, a connection with their mm -hmm. community, a connection in their heart for the natural resources that are around them. It's basically a science lab that's mm -hmm. a hands-on experience with science equipment, and so they get to be a scientist for that block of time, yeah. and we test for four different qualities of the water, 
they uh, interact with each other in a science team, they work through science and engineering practices, we review tons of things that they hopefully learned third, fourth grade and set them up for things they're gonna move on to in sixth grade. So it's about things in their real world. For our students, it's a really big deal in this age of technology. Not a lot of kids go out inside to play or to uh, interact with the natural resources that we have in the land. So to have it being brought in is really amazing to them for them to be able to experience that hands-on. And then here in the Mississippi Delta, they don't necessarily get a lot of opportunities to go out and venture to do these kinds of experiments. So having the opportunity for it to come in-house is a really big deal for our kids. Yeah. Even if we help someone, as one of the students kind of form their attitude about science mm -hmm. and the way they look at it. That's yeah. always a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When you consider our limited resources, this is awesome for us because uh, if it was not for expert partners like uh, TVA, they would not be privy to such opportunities. We are hoping that our students would um, become more interested in STEM careers. If we can expose our students to these type of um, avenues early, mm -hmm. then hoping they, we're hoping that they will develop a career path and not be afraid, because yeah. I think a lot of them fear uh, science, science, math, and engineering yeah. fields because they haven't really been exposed to it by this being a rural area. So to be able to partner uh, with uh, entities like TVA is for providing that extra external avenue yeah. that will help them kind of develop that mindset early on as to uh, what would they, they would like to choose for a career path. Watching Vicki instruct and excite the classes at Quitman Middle School, I was reminded that it's hard to care about what you don't know. Giving these students insight into water sources where they swim and play, she was able to draw a very personal connection to the protection of this natural resource. In the immediate, hopefully that's something they carry into their day-to-day -day actions, but for some of them, it's an interest that could inspire a career as well. Before heading home, I was inspired to make one final stop at a place called the Shack Up Inn, which, according to owner Bill Talbot, is as much about giving travelers an insight into the historical significance of sharecropping as it is about giving them a place to rest their weary heads. I'd bought the four bay tractor shed right behind you in 95 and fixed okay. it up as my home. Okay. And I was the only person living on this side of the road for three years. It was perfectly quiet and still. And then we pulled up a shack and then yeah. things started rolling. Okay. And then more shacks and more shacks. Right. And then we bought the gin in 2004. And the gin was already here, right? Yeah, it was already okay. here, but we went in and it, all the machinery had been shipped to Brazil back in the early 80s. Mm. So it was just an empty shell. But this farm was founded in 1852. Okay. And I think it's a, in its heyday, there were 4,000 acres here. Mm. In 1944, the cotton picking machine was invented here and premiered here. We just pulled up a shack in 1998 to have a place to drink beer and listen to music and play music. But we acquired one house, okay. set it down, and then here come the Europeans wanting to let it. And then they kept on coming. Were you like, what in the world? Yeah, I thought, <laughs> you're not in your right mind. <laughs> but you're like, okay. But they kept coming, so we started getting more shacks. <laughs> And before you know it, you know, mm -hmm. Robert Clay came from Birdie, Mississippi, and it was out in the middle of nowhere. There was not another sign of civilization, no light poles, no nothing. But he raised seven sons in this house without running water or electricity. Well, the story goes, his seven sons came back mm -hmm. and tried to get the old guy to move out of there in later life, and Robert wouldn't leave. No, he just said, no, home. I don't want electricity, I don't want, you know. Man. Anyway, he passed away in 98. We moved the shack in here. Okay. We opened up the attic, and we found Robert's whiskey still. So we figured that's why that's why Robert didn't want to go anywhere. He's he was like, I have everything he I was need. content. Yeah. And what you think about it, you know, there's a lot of a lot of security in knowing you got money in the bank, but when you got your whiskey still in the attic, I mean that's security. He'd probably been moonshining for a while. Oh yeah, no, it's probably yeah. put his kids through school. <laughs> that wagon is the frame of a World War I infantry truck. Really? Yeah, could you imagine the rough ride? Look at those tires. Uh-huh. They'll never go flat though. <laughs> Yeah, I reckon not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the people that do come here, primarily people from overseas, a lot of them know more about us than we do, which I think is a little on the strange side. But when you think about it, had it not been for the people overseas, the, the, the Claptons, the Stones, the Yardbirds, you know, the older uh, rock group that took the Delta Blues music and tweaked it and threw it out there to the world and the world went nuts over it, then everybody realizes, well, hell, it came from Coahoma County. <laughs> so it's a little weird in that respect. From what I hear, the Shack Up Inn is more than just a collection of old sharecropper shacks. The acoustics of the main hall are an attraction as well. You know, from here, you can, I think you can feel, I don't know whether it's in the air, whether it's the vibe, 
but so many people have talked about they've come here and it just doesn't feel like anywhere else. The shacks and some of this, the old stuff here, I think is what people in Europe expect out of America. This is Americana. Mm -hmm. And uh, there ain't much Americana left in America because it's all strip malls and metal buildings and, uh, but just because it was old to put up something new and the old stuff was a lot better than the new stuff they put up and I don't understand that mentality of just because it's old, yeah. you know, put a new roof on it. Right. By the end of my trip, I crisscrossed Clarksdale until the streets became familiar and the citizens felt like family. Sure, the small size helped, but it was more the heart of those who call this place home. They were hospitable and humble, but ambitious all the same. The city has seen firsthand what happens when you stay true to yourself and let the song that's inside ring out for all to hear. It's a sound that can catch on and carry around the world. In many ways, the influence of the Delta Blues can't be overstated. It went on to form the foundation of rock and roll and pop, among others, as well as inspired too many modern musicians to list. But if nothing else, it was an art form that was truly owned by a population that wasn't otherwise allowed to own much of anything. And for that reason, today it still moves your feet as much as your soul. It deserves celebrating and it's earned appreciating. So the next time you find yourself scooting through Mississippi, follow the music and make your way past the crossroads. These days, the only deal you'll have to make is which venue to visit first. <laughs>